Today we're going to set up AWS Cognito user pools to build a serverless authentication system with zero code. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Morrison. Thanks for stopping by my channel. I'm a full stack developer and content creator here on YouTube and on my blog. Today we're going to look at how you can use AWS Cognito to build a serverless authentication system using OAuth for nearly any application. Uh, Cognito is a user management system that's been built by AWS for users to implement in, or for developers to implement into their applications um, without having to handle some of the um, complex logic that goes around user authentication system. It really kind of pulls the responsibilities away from the developer and hands them over to AWS, which is a great thing. For those who don't know, OAuth is an open standard built around authentication system that allows you to do uh, the simple things that you'd expect, like allow users to sign in with usernames and passwords, but also uh, do cross-service authentication. So if you've ever seen a button on a website that says something along the lines of sign in with Google and then you're redirected to Google's website to sign in, but magically you're signed into the application, that's OAuth in action. The end goal of OAuth is to issue something called the JWT or JSON Web Token that can be used to identify that user for authentication. It has several benefits over the traditional uh, basic authentication style, which, basic, which is just the username and password and then anyone can get into it. So we'll explore some of those things towards the end of the video. Before we get started, if you like content around serverless, go, um, or scripting and automation, do me a favor, uh, hit the subscribe button, like this video and share it out with your friends. Um, yeah, let's get into it. All right, so here we are at the default landing page of the AWS console. So the quickest way to find Cognito, you can see I have it in my recently visited, but if this is the first time you're using Cognito or accessing it, it's not going to be there. Use this uh, search box at the top, which, is a, which you can use to search for all AWS services and just type in Cognito. Uh, let's open this guy up. Now you can see I have one user pool. If you don't have any user pools created already, it's going to show a completely different page with a big with a big button on the right hand side that says create user pool, which is effectively the same thing as this button here. So I'm going to go ahead and click this. So here, this is where we can start to set up our authentication providers. You can see there's two options here. There's Cognito user pool, which is checked by default. And this is how you would create and manage users within Cognito. But there's also federated identity, which if you wanted to set up some of that like sign in with Google uh, logic that I mentioned earlier in the intro, uh, you would check that. We're not going to do that today. Uh, now, as far as sign-in options, um, we've got to pick one of these. So I'm going to select email. That's generally my preferred way of signing in. Usually one user has access to one email, something along those lines. So we'll go ahead and select that and click next. Uh, now, inside of here, there's not a whole lot to change here. You can see there's password policies. We'll leave this as default. Uh, the multi-factor authentication is the one spot where I do want to change it. I want to select no MFA. If you're building this for a production environment, having multi-factor authentication is definitely recommended, um, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this video, so I'm going to skip that process. Um, we can see we have self-service account recovery, which allows users to reset their own passwords, um, and then here's where those uh, recovery messages would go to. Now we're just going to select, leave that all selected as default and go ahead and click next. Now there's nothing to change on this page, but the one thing I really want to call out is on the top, this self-service sign-up. If you are building a public application where you want anybody to be able to create a user account for your application, leave that checked. If you're building something internally, you want to leave that unchecked because that basically means that anybody on the street can come in and create an account for your internal system. Um, so I'm going to leave that checked because it doesn't really matter for this video. So that's fine. Let's scroll down to the bottom and click next. Now inside of email, you've got a couple of options here. One is to uh, you can send email messages um, like password resets and such uh, using SES, which is a completely separate service inside of AWS that I'm not going to discuss at all today. Uh, we could also select send email with Cognito, which is totally fine. This just means that Cognito's, AWS and Cognito are going to kind of handle sending those, those emails to us instead of having us set up our own uh, email server to do so. Click next again. Um, now inside of enter a user pool name, uh, this is kind of arbitrary. It's whatever you want to use to identify it within your AWS console. So we'll do uh, my user pool, keep it nice and simple. And there are a bunch of actually uh, configurations on this page we want to set up. Uh, we're going to want to enable the uh, Cognito hosted UI, which this is this allows uh, Cognito to create a, a, a sign in form and all the necessary logic for users to be able to sign into the application without you actually having to build something yourself. So it's really handy. Um, down on the bottom, we want to use a Cognito domain. You can use a custom domain, but there's a little more setup involved there involving other services. So again, we're going to kind of skip that. Um, now the Cognito domain needs to be unique within the region you are using. So this has to be something that no other AWS user, uh, even outside of your organization or account have, have used. So let's give this one a try and see if I got one. <laughs> so we'll do my user pool and then we'll make this, whoops, can't type pool apparently today. 
and we'll set this to uh, ASDF123, right? Some random keys on the keyboard. So if we scroll down a bit more, uh, under the initial app client, we want uh, public client to be uh, selected. App client name, again, kind of arbitrary, so I'll do uh, default app client. This is just, again, to identify it within your system. Uh, the, the app clients are used to handle certain permissions if you wanted to have, um, say, some users have access to certain bits of your system and other users have access to different bits. Um, you can create multiple app clients that can control some of that logic. Uh, we only need one, so we'll leave it as default. We want to make sure not to generate a client secret because that's typically used for server to a server authentication, which we're not going to be doing in this uh, video. And the callback URL, this is important. This is required in order to actually have that sign in. And essentially, which we'll see about the end of the video, once you actually sign in a user, it redirects them to this site with the tokens that we're going to that Cognito is going to create in the URL. Uh, JWT.io is a very nice tool for uh, kind of debugging these things and showing what the, the JWTs look like um, on screen. So we're going to go ahead and select that as our redirect. Uh, now, there's one more thing we have to change under advance. Now, by default, uh, under grant types is what we want to go to. Um, this authentication code grant is selected. Now, OAuth is an open standard, but it supports a couple of different flows. Uh, code grant is the most secure, but it also requires you to write some code to basically validate a, a code that's provided by AWS with their backend systems to make sure the client is supposed to be accessing that user. Um, there's definitely more setup involved, and I highly recommend you explore that. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to select implicit grant, which just generates those tokens and passes them in the URL, like I had mentioned before. Um, so I want to make sure to check that. And then we're pretty much done on this page. Let's scroll down to the bottom, click next. And then this is a page you can use to review everything. I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and click create user pool. And it's going to create our user pool. OK, so now we can see we have my user pool is created in our list of user pools. Let's go ahead and select that. And right away, we're dropped into this view where we can see the users that uh, exist inside of our system and then some of the statuses around them and various information. So anyway, we don't have any users right now. All right, so we're going to go ahead and click on create user. I'm going to select send an email invitation. What this is going to do is, as it kind of states, is it's going to send this email address an email stating that um, here's your, your username or email address and here's your temporary password that you need to use to reset your account. So I'm going to use mine, brian at brianmorrison.me, so I can show you what that email looks like. Uh, we're going to mark the email as verified because we don't need the person to actually verify the email. It's mine, so that's fine. Uh, and then we're going to select generate a password. Uh, we'll let I can, you know, generate the password. Now, one of the kind of gotchas here, just as a quick aside, is if you set a password like this, the user still needs to reset their password. So um, it, it doesn't really matter what this default thing is set to. You're still going to have to sign in and, and have the user select a password, which is why I'm just I just select generate a password. Now, let's go ahead and create user. Now you can see here, um, here is our username. The username is not necessarily the, you can see it's not the email address, but it's just this random GUID here. This is kind of the user's unique identifier. Uh, the email address field actually has our email address, which we're gonna use to sign in. Um, and then we can see the status here is force change password. Again, this doesn't matter if you set your own email or your own password, it's still gonna force you to change your password. So instead of pulling out my email, I'll show you screen. I'm gonna put a screenshot kind of right here on the screen, which is gonna see, you'll see what the email address looks like with that temporary password. Okay, so now we're going to test sign in, but there's no direct kind of login link that you're going to find from here. Um, since OAuth is a standard, there's a, a standard kind of set of URLs that need to be uh, crafted and created for users to be able to sign in. And if you're familiar with the protocol, um, you kind of know what to do. And if you're not, which you're probably not if you're here, well, maybe you are, I don't know. <laughs> um, we're going to have, I'll show you how to create the one for uh, this implicit grant type that we, we just did. So I'm going to open up a new tab here. And I'm going to, oh, actually, first, we need to go back into our user pool, go to app integration. And then the, the first part we need to grab is this Cognito domain, because this is going to be the, the main portion of the domain, the host name, that's going to be used for sign-in. So I'm going to copy that and go over to a new tab, paste that in. Now we need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, forward slash OAuth2, forward slash authorize, which is going to be that actual login form. And there's a couple of query parameters we have to pass in here. Uh, so we'll put a question mark there. The first thing we need to pass in is, uh, let's see, it is response type. We're going to set that to token, which basically tells Cognito we're trying to use implicit grant in order to sign in to the implicit flow. Uh, we'll put an ampersand to add another thing in here. We'll do uh, client underscore ID. And that is actually going to be back in the user pool. If you scroll down, if you remember in the, uh, the onboarding wizard, we created an app client, my default app client. Let's go ahead and copy that client ID and we'll go back into our new tab and paste that in. And the last piece we need inside of the URL is going to be the redirect URI. And this is going to be equal to HTTPS 
colon slash slash jwt.io. This was what we set that re that callback URL uh, in the uh, onboarding wizard again. So I'm gonna hit enter here and we should be redirected to this page here, which this is that hosted UI uh, that I had mentioned earlier in the video. We'll type in Brian at brianmorrison.me. And I have that password saved over here. So I'm gonna copy that and paste that in here. We'll sign up or sign in. Uh, no Chrome, I don't want you to remember. And then it's gonna ask us for a new password. So we're going to go ultra super secret password. Why not? Uh, ultra super secret password, exclamation point. Ah, I need, you see, it's got all these extra uh, pieces in here. Let's just go ahead and say password one, two, three, exclamation point, and then password one, two, three, exclamation point. Make it a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and click send. And if all is successful, we are redirected to jwt.io with this token inside of the encoded portion. Now, as you can see, a, a JWT or JIT is uh, three separate sections. Uh, it's, they're, they're base 64 encoded values that are separated by a period in between the sections. Uh, we have the header, which contains information about the signing algorithm. We have the body or the claims or the payload, which actually has information about that token and who it's about and what it's supposed to be used for. And then we have the signature, which is a signed uh, representation of this token um, that's been kind of, again, securely signed by AWS on the back end. And this is kind of where some of that security comes into play. If you modify any portion of the header or the claims, it renders the signature invalid and therefore the system's gonna know that this token's been tampered with. A couple of pieces to call out inside of the payload is we have the ISS, which is the issuer. This is who created the token. You can see we have our uh, Cognito URL in here. Uh, this this portion afterwards, even though we don't have the my user pool portion of the domain, this is the identifier for that user pool. Uh, we also have the username, which is that GUID that I had called out. Uh, the email address is right down here, Brian at BrianMorrison.me, and then IAT is issued at and EXP is expiration at. Now the, this is important because, and this is one of the most secure things about Jits is. If you're using base 64 encoded usernames and passwords, like the basic authentication scheme used to be used in older applications on the web, anyone who gets that basically can decode it and get your username and password. Uh, with JITs, none of that's in here. Um, however, these do these are set to expire. So you can you can customize the expiration time or the, 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 the time in which the tokens are valid inside of Cognito by default, I think it's an hour. Um, so basically, if anybody were to grab this token and you know do something with it, it's only valid for an hour after which time you'd need to re-sign in and get another token and you know, then you're kind of off to doing what you're doing. So the one thing I, more, the last thing I want to call out is where this token came from. And that's actually inside of the URL. So this is how uh, OAuth, OAuth systems will generate the tokens and send them back to the client in an implicit grant flow. I'm going to open up VS code and I'm going to do some trickery here like that guy. Uh, let's create a new tab. I'm going to paste this in here. Let's zoom in here a little bit too, so we get a better view of this. And then what I'm going to do is control H. We will find all instances of the ampersand. I'm going to turn on regex and we will replace that with a, a new line and an ampersand. Go ahead and replace all. And we should have seen all of our values actually pulled out. Now, uh, each of these things means something a little bit different. You can see there's the URL. Uh, the ID token is actually what was displayed inside of uh, um, JWT.io, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, this is what's displayed inside of uh, JWT.io. And what this is, is kind of like this, this is the token that represents the user that says, this is who this user is. The access token can contain additional information about what the user has access to, and they're both used differently under different circumstances. Uh, expires in is the number of seconds until that token expires, 3600 is one hour. And token type is bearer, that's the scheme that we're gonna use. So if you were to use this token inside of an authorization header, uh, again, if you're familiar with it, typically you would do basic, it, it, the authorization header would be set up as basic and then a space and then that then that encoded value of your username and password. Uh, inside of here, however, you would use bearer instead of basic with a space and then your ID or access token depending on your application is set up. If you enjoyed this video and want to support my channel, you can do so by simply liking the video, subscribing to my channel and sharing it out with your friends. If you like content that is around Go and serverless and AWS, uh, you're going to love to subscribe. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, at BrianMMDev is my uh, handle. DMs are open. LearnBuildTeach.com is where the, is to join the Discord server that I'm generally a part of. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.